We recognize that CVUUS gathers on the land of the Western Abenaki people. We respect their spiritual relationship to the land, and we hope to learn from them how we can live together in peace and justice. If you wear hearing aids, you have to take off your mask carefully. <laughs> Good, morning. Good morning. And welcome on this glorious, quintessential Vermont Sunday to the Champlain Valley Unitarian Universalist Society's All Access Sunday Service. If you're a little chilly, you may notice that we, by opening some windows and doors, we're trying to keep each other safe. So if you feel like you need to go get your coat and keep it with you, this might be a good time. Welcome to those of you who are here in person. It is so nice to see you all here. And welcome to those of you who are joining us online. That is such a blessing as well. If you're online and this is your first time joining us, please contact us via the email address you can find on our website and we'll send you our weekly email blast so that you can get to know more about us. If you are joining us here in person for the first time, there's a wonderful book you can sign outside on the table and you will get that email blast as well. My name is Becky Strum. I'm a member of this congregation serving as worship associate for our settled minister, the Reverend Barnaby Feeder, who will be reflecting today on how you use have historically been radically in favor of knowing and what that means for us today. Many folks helped with the service today. I wanna to welcome back Chuck. It's great to see him as our accompanist. Thanks to our guest speaker, Yoshin Burns, Rich Wolfson, Sherman LaRose, Margie and Jordan Young for this technical support that we need so much. Bobby Carnwaith for flowers, Mike Greenwood and Alan Moore, all who helped set up, usher, greet and provide hospitality. Staying connected has been a crucial concern during this time of COVID. And so today I'm delighted to report that here at CVU US, we continue to provide more and more opportunities for human connection in our addition to our Sunday services. Many opportunities are in the hard copy of our order of service today, also in the weekly blast and monthly newsletter. I'm going to highlight a few of them. First of all, Carl Lindholm is putting together an amazing service, an all soul service for next Sunday. And one of the things that's going to make it so terrific is that it's going to involve you. Uh, it is still not too late to let Carl know that you are interested in being involved in this service. Um, talking about, for just three to four minutes, about a favorite ancestor, somebody who was the most inspiring or most amusing, most unusual, 
most lovable. And you can let Carl know today he's right here with us. Widening the Circle of Concern Report is a study group with Reverend Barnaby on how racism impacts our and other UU congregations. It's not too late to join the next class uh, of that group, which is this Thursday, October 28th. Contact Reverend Barnaby if you're interested. Age Well, which organizes Meals on Wheels, is in an urgent need of volunteers for Addison County, especially for homes in Middlebury, Bridport, and Virgins. Delivery is typically from 9.30 to 11.30 a.m., weekdays only. Volunteer for a day or be an occasional substitute, and if you're interested in this, you can uh, reach out to Mary Conlon, Mike Greenwood, or Ted Shy. Radical Love Giveaway Raffle is back. The 2021 version will be online. There are details on this in, your, in the hard copy of the Order of Service and also lots of details that can be found online. Also, today we are experimenting for the first time with a modified in-person coffee hour downstairs, um, please join us after the service. Come, let us worship together. Let us open our minds to the challenge of reason. Let us open our hearts to the healing of love, open our lives to the calling of conscience, open our souls to the comfort of joy. Astonished by the miracle of life, grateful for the gift of fellowship, confident in the power of living faith, we are gathered here. Come, let us worship. As we light the chalice, as Reverend Barnaby lights the chalice, the symbol of Unitarian Universalism, please join me the words are in your order of service and I think in the chat online. <clears throat> wherever you are coming from this morning, wherever you are going, look to this flame and know we lit it for you. Now we are one. I'm going to invite Joshin Burns to the stage now for our spiritual practice for all ages. Long haulers will know that this has traditionally been a time for all ages when we were able to have children with us in the sanctuary and there would be some story time and, and sharing uh, with the children before they went off to their religious exploration. We're hanging on to that name, that time for all ages for when Poppy can come back with the kids and we're keeping the for all ages and, and substituting different things in this spot for the meantime. And we have a great opportunity for participation with one of our favorite collaborators in the community, the Zen Center. And Joshin's going to tell you about it. Can I take the mask off to talk? Yeah. Yeah, great. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all. Welcome. Lovely to always come back to this beautiful, loving, and warming, warm congregation. It's really nice to see you. And for those of you I haven't met before, I'm Joe Shin, and I'm the guiding teacher and priest up at a little Zen center up the road called Breadloaf Mountain Zen Community. We are a Zen peacemaker community, which uh, in a nutshell, I would say, takes a lot of the old and beautiful traditions of Zen Buddhism and repurposes them for our contemporary world. And, uh, you know, in the effort, like all of you, to relieve some suffering. And so uh, we have many different practices. One of our very ancient practices is sewing. In fact, I wore my raka suit today to kind of show you that we sew all of our own robes by hand including those big giant robes that we sometimes wear in ceremony. And it's a beautiful practice, a very ancient practice that goes all the way back to the Buddha. And uh, robes were sewn historically from 
discarded or donated fabric. So they would go basically through the town dump and look for cloth that sometimes was used to wrap dead bodies in or to clean bodies um, or were used for diapers, all kinds of things. And the monks would take these discarded cloths and wash them and then sew them into sacred garments. And it's a wonderful symbol, right? That nothing, nothing is not sacred. Everything has this sacred value and purpose if we set our eyes on it in the right way. So we've taken this ancient practice of sewing and we're launching this winter uh, what we're calling the Peacemaker Quilting Project. And so this is our first Zen Peacemaker quilt. fun to do. You see it's about twin size. And all this fabric has either been donated or repurposed from some other source. And uh, there's a, a beautiful teaching from the 13th century about this sewing where the Zen master Dogen says that uh, these robes can be made out of anything, even purchased cloth, donated cloth, leather, feathers, all kinds of stuff. We're sticking to cotton right on this. Holding. Yeah, you for the people at home, you can say See, bye. yeah, so you can hear. There you go. And, um, and so what we're doing is taking that old practice of sewing, and we are now crowdsourcing, contemporary term that's come about in the last number of years, uh, quilts. So people all over the world are making pieces of quilt, uh, the, the patchwork part, and sending them in to us here in Vermont, and then our local community is sewing them together into these quilts, all of which will go into uh, the kids who are in the foster care system. So we'll be gifting these quilts to kids as they kind of move through different homes, hopefully as something that brings a little comfort and care and coziness and light, um, you know, joy in, into their lives. So right now we're in the phase of um, putting teams together. We already have a team formed in England, a team in Canada, a team in North Carolina. Of course, we have a Vermont team forming. And uh, in chatting uh, with Barnaby, we thought it might be nice to extend the invitation for a CVU US team in case there are people who uh, enjoy this practice of taking fragments and sewing them back together into wholeness, uh, which is a metaphor for what we're doing in our spiritual lives anyway. And so I have information here for that. The, the, the blocks we're gonna be making are actually very, thank you, simple. Um, so I just wanna show you those. So we're gonna be doing very simple blocks of uh, triangles like this, really simple. And we're collecting them, like I said, from all over the place. And then these can be put together in all kinds of different geometric patterns, which so that every quilt looks unique and different and is like an expression of creativity. And the fabrics we're hoping that people will use when they make these blocks are kid-friendly, wonderful fabrics. We've already collected fabrics of superheroes and Spider-Man and kittens and dogs, and this has uh, bunnies and moons on it. So this is something you can be really creative, kind of finding fabric that have been a part of an old shirt or curtains or sheets in your house, or you can go and purchase fabric if you like and just make it as a donation uh, to this project, and you can sew yourself or you can send us the fabric and we'll make something happen. So if you'd like to create a CVU US team, we have, I have brochures with me about the project, which explain step-by-step step how to go through, including the sewing instructions for this block. Anybody can do this, believe me. If I can do it, you can do it. And uh, we just invite you to kind of have fun with this project. We're gonna be sewing all winter long and uh, we hope that then by summer and fall of next year, we'll have a whole set of quilts that we can uh, uh, give to kids who are moving through the system. We're, we're thinking now, it was actually Sue who had the great idea in chatting with her a couple weeks ago about this, that maybe we'll use the open door clinic 
as the venue through which to kind of identify families and people who could use these quilts. So we're looking for some good community partners who have access to uh, folks who might really make good use of a quilt and find some comfort in it. So um, that was what we're thinking, that may be one of the venues through which we kind of let things go. So it'll be a great community project with lots of great community partners. Any questions? Any questions? Great. I'll be sitting over there if you like a brochure and you're interested. You can also check it on our website at Breadloaf Mountain Zen. Okay? Thanks, everybody. Great to see you all. Always great to see Joshin with us here in this pulpit. Our connection, uh, for those of you who are newer, goes way back because Joshin, uh, when he first came to the area, was a member of this congregation before going on to his path to become a, a leader of a really important Zen community. So uh, we are really one at a deep level. Um, and look forward to hearing how the congregation responds to your invitation. Now, of course, we also share every week via our offering with some outside group our donations team has identified as working uh, in the same spirit we do to make the world a better place. And this month's donee is Habitat for Humanity, the Addison County chapter of Habitat for Humanity. Um, and we've had uh, a lengthier introduction to that in the past from people who are participating in the organization. So today I'll just ask you to be as generous as you're able to support this effort to build homes in this community f for people who wouldn't otherwise be able to be a part of those homes. If you're here with us today, you can, while Chuck is playing a little bit of music, which I think you'll find familiar, um, put cash or a check in this basket at the front. We're, we're not passing a basket around as we used to for COVID safety reasons, but um, there's that. You can also just put your phone on the, on the mark in the program and donate online or give online um, now or later at the, the website address there. Thank you. Underneath all that, the tune to From You I Receive to You I Give, Together We Share, and From This We Live. Another way we share is sharing milestones of joys and concerns and passages in our lives during the past week. Um, I have a yellow card here from Martha Fulda and Avi Freund about a trip, a trip to Columbia, Maryland to visit Martha's family and friends down there and a trip that was built around visiting um, 
Martha's grandson, Cameron, who Martha spent a year taking care of the first year of his life. And now they're down watching him play in the waters of Chesapeake Bay on, on an 85 degree day, that recently, 85 degree day, and going into Washington, D.C. And, and around to see various friends. It was a, a very heartwarming trip. And they were they're glad to be back. We're so glad you were able to, to get that time with family. Um, a shorter trip, uh, the note comes from Sherman and Donna LaRose, more than halfway through her first semester at Mount Holyoke in South Hadley, Massachusetts. Journey is doing well. They know that because they went down to visit her. She's created a lovely community that includes a Friday night UU group. She's also just started an early morning practice sessions with her track team. They're so proud of her and can't wait to see her at home for Thanksgiving. Well, Journey's been a beloved member of this congregation ever since she was a child and then taking care of, of the babies in the, in, in the room for infants. And we're so glad that she's really well launched on her college career. The last um, milestone that I received this week um, has to do in part with a trip that couldn't be made. Um, Sue Rasmussen's brother, um, known as Butch, formerly named Robert, Lives in, lived in Arizona, and he died um, just short of his 81st birthday, which had been a target for him before he learned that he had cancer. Uh, Sue is not going to be able to journey out to Arizona for the funeral, but she's hoping that they'll be able to make it available to her on Zoom. Whether or not she makes the funeral, she has a place in our hearts, and we know we're going to send our love to her in the form of cards and all kinds of other way. Um, she grew up in Arizona, so in some ways, when something like this happens, she feels a long way from her, her native home. We always leave time for silent meditation or prayer for all of the unspoken joys and concerns we arrive here with. Sometimes I just dump you into that time. Sometimes I lead you in with a prayer. Today I want to share a prayer from Reverend David Bumba. And at the end of our time of silence, um, we'll be brought out by Chuck with some music. We are here dedicated to the proposition that beneath all our differences, behind all our diversity, there is a unity that binds us forever together in spite of time and death and the space between stars, we pause in silent witness to that unity.
and recounts a scene where the resurrected Jesus had appe has appeared to his disciples after his crucifixion. But Thomas, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered, my Lord, my God. Jesus said, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Our modern reading is one of the poet Theodore Retke's most famous work, works, which was first published in 1953, The Waking. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. I feel my fate in what I cannot fear. I learn by going where I have to go. We think by feeling. What is there to know? I hear my being dance from ear to ear. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. Of those so close beside me, which are you? God bless the ground. I shall walk softly there and learn by going where I have to go. Light takes the tree, but who can tell us how? The lowly worm climbs up a winding stair. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. Great nature has another thing to do to you and me, so take the lively air and lovely learn by going where to go. This shaking keeps me steady, I should know. What falls away is always and is near. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. I learn by going where I have to go. This tradition of the minister in the sermon is, dates back to even before our, our particular denomination got founded in this country, but we don't often stop to think that like nations and, and families, sermons have origin stories. Every single sermon has an origin story. The work that inspired this sermon began in the 1990s. The instinct to explore that inspired it is as old as life itself. And the essay that inspired it was published in August in The New Yorker. The event that inspired the essay was the launch of a rocket carrying the James Webb Space Telescope into a much darker place in the solar system than our brilliant Earth, which in August, when the article was written, was scheduled for next month. I had just been looking online at some stunning, stunning color photos that had been taken by the Hubble telescope of distant stars and galaxies and nebulae when I read the essay about the James Webb telescope. And boy, this is a situation where I wish we already had our, our TV screens 
that we're going to be installing because I could have showed you some of those images the Hubble took. Anyway, these images were so exciting and then I read that the James Webb telescope was designed to take us where Hubble couldn't in our exploration of the cosmos. Now we would be able to probe the atmospheres of Earth-like planets circling distant stars for signs of life and to see stars being formed in distant dust clouds that Hubble's light sensors couldn't penetrate. And we would be able to peer so deep into the expanding universe that we would capture clear images of infrared light emitted from the first stars and galaxies formed after the Big Bang many billions of years ago, a time when the only elements around, according to our current understanding, were hydrogen and helium. It took the formation of these now long gone stars we are about to see and their subsequent explosions to create and spread carbon, iron, and all the other heavier elements without which our solar system, our planet, and life itself would not have appeared. These stars were the ultimate ancestors, the celestial Adams and Eves. Wow, I thought. We may get to be eyewitnesses to a major rewrite of sciences in the beginning story for our universe. That's got to be worth the $10 billion the telescope has cost so far. That's got to be worth the constant design, constructions, and testing complications that have repeatedly increased the cost and delayed a launch that was originally scheduled for 2006, which, by the way, has recently been delayed again and will now no longer be in November, but is scheduled for December 18th. It's got to be worth the substantial risk that after a month of travel away from Earth, towards its orbital site, nearly a million miles away, far beyond the moon, and any hope we currently have for being able to repair it if something goes wrong, the Webb telescope will prove to be a partial or complete bust. Maybe the five paper-thin reflective foil sheets, each the size of a tennis court, will fail to unfurl en route. That would leave the telescope insufficiently shielded from the light and heat from the sun to get high quality images. Maybe the giant gold coated light collecting mirrors facing into the night won't unfold. To use the words of the New Yorker article, open out like an enormous night blooming flower. I can't wait for that day in January when we might first get signals telling us it's working. Toward the end of the New Yorker article, I read these words linking astronomy and religion. The 17th century astronomer Johannes Kepler studied the physical world for messages he felt that God had written into the book of nature. Galileo, and here I'll insert a parenthetical, you may recall he spent the last part of his life under house arrest and was forced by the Pope to recant his observations. Galileo, in fact, had supporters inside and outside the church. Sometimes people in power have been reluctant to acknowledge the truths that science uncovers. Each time we look further, our universe gets larger. Or, depending on your perspective, we get smaller. Astronomers take the position incidentally an ethical one, of being radically in favor of knowing. Radically in favor of knowing. When I read that phrase, the first thing I could think of was, as you use, we love it that our quest for knowledge isn't just a matter of humans being curious or attracted to novelty. It's a statement of faith that there is such a thing as truth that we are called to pursue even at great risk and cost. But my understanding of what I had to say about being radically in favor of knowing had a rocky week. I was talking with my daughter Maddie on the phone about the telescope on Friday, and she confessed to being minimally interested in knowing anything about astronomy. 
especially at that moment. She had called to express her love and support for me after having endured helping a vet put Pan to sleep a few hours earlier. She knew I had never faced a more painful decision than doing this for our dog. Pan was physically healthy, but people more expert than I about dog behavior agreed that what Michelle and I had been forced to see, there was no longer any reasonable hope for completely controlling his impulses to protect himself or things he treasured by suddenly biting. Talking to Maddie, I realized that just as the universe is more immense and mysterious than even the Webb telescope can begin to unravel for us, there is forever an invisible landscape within and among each of us and between all living beings. It stretches far beyond the reach of radical commitments to exploration for the sake of knowing more. Let me say that again in a different way. Being radically in favor of knowing is not a claim that we can know everything we want to know. It's not a claim we can get there if only we worked harder and more courageously at it. The Webb telescope will in fact inevitably leave us with more and greater questions than it answers. The universe is, from everything we've learned to date, more immense and mysterious than we are wired to grasp. What is true for the universe is true in this compact corner of it we share this morning. There are spaces within and among us where the limits of what we can know can be sensed as powerful presences, but never explained. One feature of these spaces is that life calls us to simply be compassionately present to suffering, both of our own and that of others. Only by welcoming our saddest feelings and tears by being present without seeking to understand everything, can we approach knowing how to live well in these moments and with any luck begin healing. As I held Pan's paw and stroked his brow while the anesthetic stopped his heartbeat, I kept coming back to the mantra for our explorations this fall of how we can nurture community here at CVUUS. Let's see what love can do. Many realms of knowledge are vital to us, but being radically in favor of knowing what life feels like to each of us is so very, very different from being radically in favor of knowing the physical history of the universe, even though that history is ours. The poet Vyshlava Zimborska said it better than I could in the poem that I sent to you Friday in my weekend greeting. Here are just a few excerpts. Life is the only way to be a dog, to stroke its warm fur, to tell pain from everything it's not, to squeeze inside events, to seek the least of all possible mistakes, and to keep on not knowing something important. I won't say much more about Pan this morning because one thing I know for sure is that not knowing surrounds what I've been through. Pan's death is not something to be transformed anytime soon, if ever, into a neat lesson with false borders. I got help understanding that from Theodore Rethke's poem, The Waking. Being radically in favor of knowing is to always be open to learning by going where you have to go. Whether it's deep space or deep stillness. There is an ever shifting frontier zone separating what we can know about existence, including life, through more investment in science and what we can experience of life through more attention to our feelings, stories, and intuitions. Rethke's words comfort us. Feeling unsettled and even doomed to die is not a bad thing. Indeed, it, it confirms that we are alive. 
This shaking keeps me steady, he says to his beloved. I should know. Is he reassuring us he speaks from experience or chiding himself for doubting it? Maybe it's both. But then he adds, what falls away is always and is near. I think all of us have times when we doubt that, when what has fallen away feels truly lost to us. But I think we all have moments as well when we are once again living through a sense of the past being near at hand, claiming its role in keeping us shaking as long as we are alive. I know through feeling I have time with Pan ahead of me. It's important to me to say all of this to you here from this pulpit you've lent to me. As your minister, I hope you will be proud that the idea of being radically in favor of knowing is deeply rooted in our UU history and principles. And it's a recognition that truths can only be known by looking fearlessly at reality as we perceive it. This is exactly what's going on now with our struggles to expand our knowledge of America's racial history and to connect more authentically with its treatment of indigenous people. This spirit of radically being in favor of knowledge to guide us in justice work and compassion practices is not as divorced from scientific inquiry as you might think. In the case of the Webb Telescope, we see truth being pursued deep into the primal first chapter of the story of how all beings descend from the exact same star stuff. A related truth learned from science is that every star-born atom in our body has before our birth cycled through other bodies and plants and soils and oceans and atmospheric winds. Our building blocks have been shuffled and redealt countless times by forces as mild as tides and evaporation and as violent as volcanoes and collisions with asteroids. You've heard perhaps that the star stuff in you was once in the lungs and blood of all of your ancestors and Shakespeare and Beethoven or Jane Austen, well, you can pick your own hero. I've always thought, that's so cool. But here, in what I take as a sign, I'm actually growing a bit spiritually. I've come to realize that there's a better way to look at this universal math describing where the atomic particles of our bodies come and go. Right now, at any given moment, each of us contains huge numbers of atoms that once coursed through the bodies of enslaved black people, indigenous people, immigrants, and refugees. When we radically seek knowledge, we routinely come up with more proof that we literally embody the vision that we are all one family. And in fact, the atoms in our body are so frequently reshuffled in such great numbers that every one of you who sent me a kindly note about Pan's passing probably has some atoms in you that were formerly a part of him and you may well have large numbers of them even at this moment. I want to close by saying something about our first reading. It reminds us that what I'm talking about has been linked to seeking to what we know as sacred for a very long time. Remember in this story, there's 11 of the 12 disciples who tell Thomas that they have seen and spoken with Jesus the crucified leader they've been following around Israel and serving in challenging and sometimes even dangerous conditions. These are people whom Thomas has traveled with for many, many months, perhaps years, depending on which Bible stories you're reading, and they have no obvious reason to lie to him. And they are telling him that what Jesus has said would happen has happened. Still, here is Thomas saying he can't believe it until he has personally seen the nail marks in Jesus' hands. Indeed, he needs to touch the nail holes and put his finger in the gash 
in Jesus' side where he was struck by a sword during the crucifixion before Thomas can believe. A week later, Jesus shows up and offers the proof that Thomas requires. That's when Jesus reportedly says something that I think is pretty ambiguous. Without directly criticizing Thomas, who has, after all, been a devoted follower, Jesus notes that Thomas has taken a, a seeing is believing position. But he adds, it is those who believe without seeing him who will be blessed. Who is radically in favor of knowing in this story? Is it Thomas who craves a knowledge born of actually taking on the pain of touching the evidence of the murder of his leader and is willing to make a public spectacle among the people he loves of his doubts all in the name of truly knowing? Or is it the blessed followers to come who are willing to embrace secondhand accounts, what they will see of the impact of Jesus' teachings on the behavior of his followers, and other less scientific forms of knowing a truth? I don't have an answer to that one. To start with, I would want to know more about Thomas's feelings than the story tells us. But it should be noted the more you know about a story, the more your sense of what constitutes radically pursuing knowledge can change. Every little fact that's added can say, oh, now I see it a little bit differently. The more what's at stake can change. So be careful with your stories and, and how you tell them. Good stories about what we know and are doing to know more can make your life feel shakier. But getting radical about what you seek to know can also make you feel more alive. It may be easier to realize how connected you are to your companions who are seeking to know what love can do. So my prayer is that it be so here at Champlain Valley Unitarian Universal Society, both in times of joy and in times of pay, that we remain in favor of radically knowing with a much expanded understanding of how that can come to be. Blessed be. So I'm here this morning to report to you it's okay to be going up to the edges of holding it together and even over to not holding it together as you go through your week. If that's done to make you feel closer to the spirit of life-giving love and love-giving life, I invite you as you go out into the world this week to trust that spirit to keep you on a true path toward making the world better for you and everyone you encounter. Blessed be.